the comedy. You have permission to laugh. Awkwardly, just like that, that was perfect. <laughs> if I die before the end of this performance, I'd like to say thank you for being my last audience And if I should spontaneously combust I'd like to leave with just a few words That you can put on my last stone-carved review She loved singing, she loved science, and she played a ukulele, so creative, so intelligent. She was a very, very special lady. Her song about Pi had a million digits. Maybe it's better she died. Cause if she hadn't, well, she'd still be singing it. With the voice of an angle. With the voice of an angle, with the voice. That's it. <clears throat> of an angle. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. This is so wonderful to be on first, uh, to basically open TEDx LSE with my pre-posthumous obituary in song. I think we all need to redefine our de definition of when it is appropriate to do some good old British dark comedy. And I think, uh, yeah, 1026 is exactly when it's going to happen. Uh, thank you so much uh, for going along with that, because uh, I this... Is, uh, this is such a wonderful experience to combine music and comedy and science. And uh, I didn't want to start with something morbid for the day. In fact, I don't think I have because um, I played that on, on this thing. Uh, I mean, this is scientifically proven to be the most adorable instrument <laughs> in the world. Nothing unhappy can actually happen when you play this instrument. And oh, by the way, I said it was a ukulele. It's, it's actually not a ukulele. It is a normal sized guitar and I am just massive. I know, good, good. You all enjoyed that, that was lovely. I'm glad you did because uh, uh, there's nothing more you can expect from me than a few good maths puns because uh, I, I'm the person who puts this on their business card. I mean, seriously. Uh, all right, a few of you didn't get that. <laughs> it's a maths pun. It's a maths pun. It's a... It's, it's a Don't worry, I did a show at the Edinburgh Fringe and I called my show Voice of an Angle. The people of Edinburgh also didn't get it uh, and went around correcting my posters in Sharpie. So it's not supposed to be Voice of Angle, it's a maths pun. You get that, some of you get that, you get that. You understand it's a maths pun, right? I know. If you enjoyed that, the whole show will give you a, a large hadron. So, um, <clears throat> kids. So that's what it's too early for, all right. Good. So uh, I, I should probably introduce myself. I am uh, the UK's premier female uh, musical comedian, ex-physicist, science presenter, and ukulele player. That's uh, my very simple definition. Yeah. Ob obviously, by premier, I mean uh, the only one. Yes. It's very easy to be the best at something when you are the only one doing it. But that's uh, that's what I do. Uh, it's 
It's a little bit odd to be doing something so niche and yet making a career out of it. It's so niche what I do that not even LinkedIn send me invitations to join their professional network anymore. <laughs> it's that extraordinary, but that's what I do with my life. I write songs about science, I talk about science. Uh, I'm not going to do any of them now because you can see them online. You can see them on online age. You can see my song uh, about uh, the sun, about coronal mass ejections, which has been actually tested and fact-checked by a solar physicist, making it my first peer-reviewed song. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, and that's actually my, one of my favourite songs because it's been used by someone in an open university course. I know, it's properly educational. And uh, also proves that the open university is a lot more open than anyone <laughs> initially expected. But that's the kind of thing I do. I write songs about science. And um, the question really you might be asking is why do I do that? Why do I try and combine science and songs and comedy? Well. The reason I do it is because of one conversation. I thought about this really hard before I did this talk. I, I tried to work backwards and work out at what point I decided to go into this very narrow niche. And it was a conversation. It wasn't a conversation with a physicist. It wasn't a, even a conversation with a scientist. It wasn't even a conversation with a comedian. It was a conversation with a burlesque dancer. I recommend conversations with burlesque dancers. <laughs> they don't get enough of them, if I'm honest. It's not what people go to them first. But this conversation uh, happened when I just started out doing stand-up. I was just doing stand-up. I was traveling up and down the country for years and years, doing unpaid shows every evening. It was like doing a part-time university degree in comedy. That's how it works. You do years of unpaid shows. And uh, at one point, I was traveling up and down the country on the mega bus, or as I more accurately call it, the bus. <laughs> And I was never using uh, music or science in my comedy. I was just trying to find my voice, but not using music or science. I kept them completely separate. And this conversation with this burlesque dancer, she was stunning. She was an incredible dancer, incredible singer. She had an amazing stage presence. You could not take your eyes off any part of her in her show. It was absolutely incredible. And she had so many skills. She could sing, she could dance, she could tell a story just with the tiniest flick of her wrist. It was incredible. And as a new performer, I wanted to ask her, what is her secret? And she told me that you just have to use everything you've got. You've got to use it all. If you can sing, use that. If you can dance, use that. If you can't do either, find something else. Whether you're big or small, it doesn't matter. You've just got to use every single asset. And I said, every single one, including nudity. <laughs> and she said, in my line of work, especially nudity. I mean, it really goes without saying. Uh, and I thought, well, as a comedian, I, can't, I don't want to go down the nudity route. I don't want to do full frontal nudity. But I think I can probably do a bit of full frontal nerdity. So I made a little assessment, I did an analysis of my life of what I could bring to more to my comedy. And uh, I, well, I studied a physics degree, I did a lot of data analysis. You can take the girl out of the data analysis, but you can't take the data analysis out of the girl. So I've entered my results on a Venn diagram. So these are the things that I assessed about myself. One thing is science. I have a physics degree, as Jill mentioned, from Imperial College. Uh, the reason I went there I'll tell the honest truth, is because they told me that 90% of the year would be male. 90% men. <laughs> I know. 90% men. All the women in the room are giggling at that more than, more than the men. Well, you know, I'm not surprised because they also had a phrase about the place which was, the odds are good, but the goods are odd. <laughs> More laughs of recognition there. So uh, that's where I met my uh, physics tutor who taught me to think like a physicist. This will always tell me when I was solving problems, you must think like a physicist. You must think like... He was from Newcastle. You must... <laughs> I must think like a physicist. So that's what I try to do. So uh, the other things I have, the other part of my, uh, my life is music. And uh, I have grade eight in two different instruments, but nowadays I choose to specialise in the ukulele. Uh, yeah, that's uh, it's not, not such a popular instrument, but I have played five times at the Royal Albert Hall. That's my, my musical claim to fame. And uh, Technically, uh, one of them was in the car park, so it was busking, but <laughs> I mean, it still counts. So, uh, and the years when I had what my mum refers to as a proper job, uh, I used to make radio programmes about classical music for the BBC. So what I've done is I have 
I'm going to squeeze together, kind of in a lift and separate motion, uh, moving science and music together. And I occupy the area between these two, between science and music. And it's an area that uh, when people write about what I do, uh, whether it's the Telegraph or Wired magazine, they always call me this, which is lovely. Isn't that a lovely phrase? I finally have a definition. I finally know who I am. Unfortunately, like the pun voice of an angle, this is prone to spelling errors. And more than once, I've been called this. Quite the same. I did try doing a Nana Muscuri tribute hour, but it didn't really work out. Um, just for avoidance of doubt, I've done a second Venn diagram, and this is a Venn diagram for a Greek songstress. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, so that's, that's better. Yeah. Good. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone thinks that mixing science and music is a good idea. Uh, there are some people often below the fold on my videos who tell me that mixing music and science diminishes both of them, and I completely disagree with that. I mean, it's, it's like they say there's a battle between music and science and I have to come down on one side or the other. I mean, if there was a battle between science and music, seriously, who would win? I mean, I mean in the 1940s, science created the atomic bomb, so... I mean, that's really it, basically. That's, <laughs> that's solved the problem. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that. I've been looking into this a bit. And in the 1990s, music created Atomic Kitten. <laughs> it's arguably a greater weapon of mass destruction, so... No, no, but don't worry, because science rallied last year, and they uh, discovered, finally, the Higgs boson. Yay! Of course, the particle that gives us mass, this mysterious particle that gives us mass. I always thought it was the Greggs, but... It's the Higgs. Uh, unfortunately, music have not managed to keep up with this. You two still have not found what they're looking for. <laughs> All right, good. All right, I'm just doing a little bit of analysis there. It was a sort of a ripple of laughter there, an unexpected burst on the front there. But you know, I, uh, I, I think like a physicist about comedy. I think like a physicist. I've been analysing this joke, and I think I can make it funnier. And the way I can make it funnier is by adding a timeline. This joke. So what we need is 1988. That is the year when you two published the results <laughs> of their unsuccessful search. We got 2012 when CERN released the successful Higgs boson search. If we take an average of those two times, now the year 2000 is the optimum space-time coordinate for that joke to be told. If I told that joke in the year 2000, you would still be laughing now. <laughs> oh, you can still feel a ripple of it going through the. Fabric of space-time as well, right now. It's amazing. Beautiful. Oh, sorry. Hang on. It's, um, it's a really early start today, so I haven't fed him. Do you want a protractor? Do you want a protractor? Go on. <laughs> so, uh, I still... Uh, I, th I think I've kind of se settled now, this, the science versus music debate, and I think I've done it with a comedy timeline, which uh, in C.P. Snow's 1959 lecture about two cultures, he never had that, so I think I've won there. But uh, comedy and science, people still ask me why I put them together and how I put them together. Even after someone's seen one of my shows, they come up to the end and say, science and comedy, how does that work? <laughs> I've just done it. But it's extraordinary. People still are telling me, and to me, it's extraordinary that it doesn't make sense. I mean, comedy and science, I see as such similar pursuits about trying to discover uh, how you feel about the world, trying to discover information about the world around you by poking it a little bit further than you would normally if you were just looking at the world. You've got to use science and comedy to delve underneath. And the first law of comedy is... Um, is that you have to write about what you are passionate about. And what I'm passionate about is science and the stories of science. You write what you're passionate about. The second law of comedy is that uh, the entropy of an isolated system uh, never decreases, so, which is in fact the same as the second law of thermodynamics. I know. Who knew? Science and comedy. Uh, so. Uh, comedy and science, to me, are the same thing. They're both about pursuing uh, what is under the surface. They're both about looking at the world around you and trying to find out more than what is just on the surface. Not just accepting the simple answer because it's simple. You want to investigate that until you know you've got it right. Not just using stereotypes, not just accepting what everyone else thinks about the world, but finding your own way and discovering more about human nature and about science. Those are the things that I think comedy and science share. So the search for the Higgs boson, 
Python, Monty Python, quantum mechanics, Big Bang Theory, they're all the same attitude to me because they're trying to find out about the world around you using the tools that you've got, poking away under the surface to see what is really going on. And in the media, you see science uh, is normally portrayed in successes, the cures, the equations, the solutions, the press releases, all of that happens. But what you don't see is the thousands of failed experiments, the thousands of failed hypotheses, the thousands of things that went wrong until something finally clicked, something unexpected told you the nature of what it was you were looking at. And so much failure goes into that, followed uh, by a desire to find out the truth. The curiosity, the human curiosity, is what keeps you going in science. And it's the same in comedy. In comedy, you don't see the hundreds of unsuccessful gigs. You don't see how you get things very, very wrong, very wrong, until you start getting, like megabuses, yeah, mistake. Uh, you don't see all of the things you get wrong until they start going right. And it, again, it's human curiosity that drives me to create comedy. And that's what drives me to create comedy about science. And, and so I think today is wonderful because you'll be doing some, uh, some learning, you'll be doing some laughing, you'll be doing some thinking like a physicist, uh, I hope. Uh, well, I will be anyway. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this, this is what is so great about today because I don't want um, people to think laughing and learning are different things. If you put them together, that can be even more powerful, and that's the thing that I try to use. And I don't think they're so separate. I don't think you can uh, create comedy without looking closely at the world, and you can't do science without looking closely at the world. And the problem is, uh, there was one big difference between science and comedy. Science is mostly facts. In fact, I'll go to, as far as to say it's, it's all facts. I mean, really, that's the point of science. Whereas comedy um, does allow in a few little, a few little fibs here and there, sometimes a few little fibs sometimes. You're allowed a few big fibs as well. Uh, but I think that's what makes it so potent as a mixture. You have to keep on your toes. You have to work out what's right from what's wrong. You have to work out the truth for yourself. And I just wanted to finish on one song. And this is actually not one of my songs. This is a song that my grandfather taught me. And I think he's a man who embodies everything that I now do. He was a, a medical man. Uh, he loved science. He loved stories. Uh, he loved things that were funny. Um, and he loved music, and he used to sing me this song. I'll leave you on this. I'll sing you a lullaby. You'll go to sleep with my lullaby. And my lullaby is why I am no longer to practice at the hospital as an anaesthetist. <laughs> Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of today.